Okay, a horror story from Baldur's Gate 3 multiplayer. We've done World of Warcraft stuff, so this definitely counts. We were in a battle with four harpies? Okay, I think this is fake. There's no harpies in Baldur's Gate 3. Oh my god, there are harpies in Baldur's Gate big is this game? Okay, we're in a battle with harpies that apparently are in Baldur's Gate 3, with cliffs and knee-deep water acting as rough terrain, with an additional mission of protecting an NPC lured by the harpy singing. Surprisingly, the escort mission wasn't the horror of the story. The kid was smart whenever he wasn't lured, and would use disengage and dash actions to get away from the fight. The battle itself was rough though, difficult terrain, enemies who could ignore it all with flight, and one harpy that would always set herself up to sing her siren song while her sisters were attacking. It seemed like every turn everyone in my party would get lured and be sitting ducks for harpy attacks. Even after they were broken out of the trance by attacks, they'd likely fall prey right after that anyway. It got so bad, our collective health was so low that our warlock, the game's host, reset the save to prevent a possible total party kill. Funnily enough, in both instances of the fight, my barbarian never once got lured. I guess he was too angry to pay attention to the singing. Isn't that like a thing? A few moments later. Hmm. Maybe not in Baldur's Gate 3, and probably not at this level, but... It is definitely a thing for that to happen. After save scumming, we had a better round against the harpies. This is where the real punchline takes place. While our bard was healing herself, I was gonna throw a hand axe at the harpy next to him since I can't reach her due to the rough terrain. Somehow, I accidentally selected the bard to attack. I use a controller while playing, which downed him and put him on death saves. The funny thing about Baldur's Gate 3 is that in multiplayer mode, the player characters take their turns simultaneously if they're next to each other in the initiative order. So our bard had to finish playing her instrument and healed himself when, the very next second, he got throwing axe inside the head. The party killed the rest of the harpies next turn, and we were able to help the bard right after. But the whole time, the three of us were laughing at the absurdity of what just happened, with me repeatedly asking, how did that even happen? The bard took the whole thing in stride, and compared the blunder to, if this was an actual role-playing game, me rolling a nat 1 on the throw, and our DM deciding to be a bit of a jerk. Since then, it's become a joke that whenever my barbarian's about to throw a weapon, the bard will instinctually duck. I do have certain friendly fire conditions in my own game, because funny, but... Goodness, accidentally selecting things in BG3 might be my least favorite part of a game I genuinely really love. Can't even blame the game. It's pretty much entirely my fault. Ugh, frustrating. Hey, first time Redditor here. Sorry in advance for any mistakes. English is not my first language. I, female, 31, am the DM of the group. The other players are a wizard, a fighter, and a cleric. Cleric, male, 60, is the problem player here. Whew, is this the oldest problem player we've ever had? I know our backlog is gargantuan, but I don't think we've seen any silver foxes. Oh, I think that's supposed to be a compliment. I might need to take that back in the future. Playtime is mostly fine. It's out of character where Cleric gets really uncomfortable onto the story. I recently came offhandly out to the group. At that time, it was just Cleric and Fighter, and Fighter already knew. Cleric wants to run the campaign in the future and was asking what my type in men was so that he could make sure they were included. I just very dryly responded that that was the wrong gender. Cleric got silent then, and I thought that he had taken the news well? Well, guess again. The next day, he sent me private messages asking if I was sure, because a few years back, I had told him I wasn't gay, and if I ever had sex with a man. He did apologize for this, but mainly for hurting my feelings, not for being disrespectful. Ah, yes. I'm sorry you The best way to say sorry to a person. Also, please note the age difference. He could easily be my father. The thing is, he has a history of sending me private messages where he jokes that he wants to invite me out for coffee, or that if I ever move again, I could move in with him and share his bed. Luckily, those private messages only pop up once every, like, half year. Still bad. I actually made a character for his campaign, Male Rangers. I really, really don't want to run any risks of him using his DM stats to give him more power than necessary over my character. I even made a backup character where I commented that I have experience being in that character's head because I actually wrote about him for 12 years. His question, are you sure you have experience being in his mind or is it rather that he has been on your mind? <laughs> The subtext being, of course, again, that I am really not gay because I think about a male character. It's just so tiring, man. TLDR, I came out to one of my players who has already shown interest in me, and now he keeps on making jokes which make me uncomfortable. The author says that Emily Dickinson was a lesbian. 
A what? A lesbian. No. She was into me. Thank you for all your kind comments. A few weeks back, I blocked Cleric on every channel, and it's been such a relief. I feel better about that. Also, have gone low contact with Wizard and Fighter because although I told them about Cleric and they assured me they had my back, I found it seemed hard for them to understand why I was getting emotional and stressed talking about that. They actually still play in the campaign Cleric announced while Cleric controls my character. Screw him. I'm so glad I got out of there. And thank you all again for the wake up call. Oof. Those guys are not allies. Okay, maybe I'm being a bit dramatic, but yeah, it does suck that your friends didn't really have your back there. I mean, what this senior citizen here was doing was not okay. Yeah, it's every half a year, but it's still weird. This kind of non-consensual flirting is not okay. Look, if someone says no or expresses disinterest, leave them alone, all right? Pursuing further is just creepy. It's wrong. Don't do it. Lordy Lord can only imagine what this guy's doing with your D&D character. Actually, you know what? I don't want to imagine, like, at all. I'm just going to banish that image from my mind and move on to the next damn bit. I was in university at the time, and nobody in my circle that I normally play with went to the same college, let alone the same major. We played whenever we could, and could do online, but I was wanting a more consistent in-person game. One day, I overheard three of my male classmates talking about tabletop role-playing games. I joined in. I have had many classes with them at this point and was on relatively good terms with these guys. This is probably where the first red flag happened though. I was in love with the game, but still new, and only had two characters on my belt. While I mentioned I had played a ranger, they scoffed and started making fun of how bad rangers are. I laughed out loud, but I was genuinely kind of hurt. As I was having a great time with this player character, I wasn't familiar enough with online D&D spaces to know that rangers had a bad rep. Okay, seriously, for the love of God. People who clown on rangers, they have no vision. Rangers, especially with some of the newer specs, they can be cool, okay? Uh, they have inconsistent design vision and aesthetic. Blah, blah, blah. I don't care, man. Guess what? I'm too busy riding on my dragon and sniping from the shadows. Flash forward a few classes later, due to the nature of the program we were in, all of us, more or less, shared the same classes the entire time. One of the guy's girlfriends, also in this program, comes up to me and asks if I'm familiar with Dungeons and Dragons. Turns out, she wants to learn how to play, but I don't know why she went to me and not her partner. I tell her that there are other people in the class who want to play too, and she gets the idea to put a group together. A day later, I'm in a group chat between the five of us playing our game. Suddenly, we are making plans to meet up in a week for a session zero and a session one. The dungeon master decided to do the session zero completely over text, then clear up anything in person and play a bit of the first session. This is where it goes a little sideways. New girl has no idea where to start, but is eager to learn. And all the other people overwhelm her by sending her link after link to websites, videos. Someone sends her an entire personality quiz for alignment charts so she could get an idea of them. I'm actually kind of curious. Like these are really inaccurate. She asks how to get started and make a new character, and me and the dungeon master give complete opposite answers. I tell her that certain races and classes have built-in lore or story prompts so she can read through some of them on D&D Beyond to see if any of them give her an idea for a character. From there, she can flesh out the personality, looks, name, and backstory. Look, this doesn't work for everyone, but that's how I made my first character and is helpful when just starting out. The dungeon master said she absolutely must start with a backstory, then figure out a race and class that best suit it. I have never heard of someone doing that. Ever. Like, I guess I do that when I make an NPC and then maybe convert them to a player character. Brand new players aren't doing- that's terrible advice, god. I don't understand how she was expected to do that if she has no idea what D&D is, but he took over as Dungeon Master, so I didn't want to speak up. In my usual circle of people who play, we enjoy intricate backstories that also flesh out the world, and because of this, players often collaborate with Dungeon Master to make sure stories are in line with the tone of the game. I thought up the story of a draconic bloodline half-elf sorceress who was shunned by her family because of her appearance, prim and proper high-elf nobles aren't fans of half-elf descendants. 
with scales. Since I had been given nothing about the campaign from the DM, I made a backstory that could be isolated, her family could reappear later, or maybe not. I could work around it. I asked for feedback on it, and he was surprised at how thorough my backstory was. I didn't go as in-depth as I do for backstories for this one, and was curious how other people's backstories were. And also, he gave no feedback. <laughs> I had time to spare that week, so I even drew the character. I find it helps me and others with roleplay if they have some kind of visual cue. Agreed! Seriously, I spend so much money on character commissions, not just because commissioning artists is cool and you should do it, but also because visual cues are so, so helpful. I love it. I mentioned multiple times that I would be willing to draw characters. They just need to send the details of what they look like. You're an angel. Nobody ever got back to me about- Dude, I am so excited. Yeah, what's up? Did you hear they added hoverboards into Destiny? Oh, dude, no, no, no. no I, art commission, man. Art commission. What? For my D&D game. I got this girl on Instagram to do some images for me. Only like $60 per piece, which not bad. You know, for the quality she's offering, not bad at $60? <laughs> what, you jealous? Yeah, but why? Because it takes work? I'd never pay an artist like that. I mean, yeah, I totally get that, you know, not everyone's got the- I actually had this girl in my group who was gonna do it for free. I told her not to bother, because I can just AI generate it. Like, why would I even- What? I'm the guy who got shot last time. The day before the session zero slash session one and the dungeon master shares, that is actually pre-made from a module. I was fine with this, but Really, wish he said something before character creation so I could make sure if my character was fitting in said module. This is also the day where the fourth player tells us, ah, uh, he can't make it. As the cherry on top, the dungeon master informs us that he will have to join online over FaceTime, while me and the remaining two players me in person. It is the day of the game, and me, new girl, and her boyfriend meet at his house and the DM over call via FaceTime. There, we had a complete nothing sandwich of a session zero. We go around sharing characters and backstories. I was hoping to reveal some of mine later, but the dungeon master insisted everyone share, so I did. The other two sat shocked, then shared their characters, which had absolutely no backstory. One was a halfling druid who just wanders in the woods and dances, and the other was an elven rogue with no traits. The girlfriend had the rogue, so I was more forgiving of her, not having much of a backstory. I was mostly shocked at how the DM nod along and was completely fine with the lack of backstory. I felt embarrassed and, like, I came off as too obsessive for the game. I've played with plenty of people, especially new people who are like this, but the DM definitely, definitely should have explained that, hey, we're not really going on depth with the backstories, because, yeah. It can be kind of weird. Then, the DM asked us if we had any triggers or topics we didn't want discussed. His tone with it was odd enough. He sounded like this was something he was obligated to ask and didn't really care about the answer. I did have a few things, namely sibling death, but I already prepped for this by making my character an only child. I didn't feel comfortable enough with the group to share this though, so I kept quiet, just making a joke about nothing too heinous. Nobody else said anything. Apparently, I should have said something, because the dungeon master has a goblin we kidnapped that just said the R slur. This made me very uncomfortable, but the other people laughed over it, so I swallowed my pride and just kept on going with the game. I know these aren't everyone's cup of tea, and I understand that, but I was the only one with any character voice. I just spoke with my normal voice and a vaguely British accent, just so people could tell when I was speaking in character. Even the dungeon master would do half-hearted voices, and by the end of whatever he was saying, he would give up and revert to his normal Normal voice. I felt alienated because in my other games, voice was a big thing since they were at least partially online. Again, I felt just embarrassed, like I was obsessive over the game. My character's personality was that she was very sweet and dainty and didn't like hurting people per se, but she didn't have adequate control over her magic and caused more harm than she means to. In character, I have her voice reservations over torturing a goblin for information, hoping for an interesting roleplay moment with the other characters. The dungeon master breaks the immersion to reprimand me for this and that it's just a goblin. Okay, so I'm gonna like rip off all the goblins' fingernails one by one and then murder his entire family in front of his eyes. Yeah. Well, we could also, you know, maybe not do that. What? What are you talking about? What are you doing? Well, I mean, you know, my, my character's a bit more like timid when it comes to this stuff, so I, I don't think I would be comfortable with your character. Yeah, the. The character, Tolula, the- I remember your stupid name. Look, why are you doing this? Alright, this isn't some stupid acting game. I'm- I'm roleplaying. We're supposed to be doing that 
role-playing stuff. This is a game. Stop taking it so seriously. Dude. Yeah, I, don't, I really don't know what you're talking about. The rest of the session was fine. He used theater of the mind and was very lenient with it. Every attack or spell he said, we were either in range or could move to not be in range, but this wasn't really kept track of. The new girl actually did well and got invested. In between the first and second session, I played around with hosting a one-shot. I had an idea for a monster hunting convention and gala that gets attacked by monsters. I wanted to use this idea for my usual group, but they weren't all available, so I thought I could at least try it on my classmates. I told them about it and gave a list of different character ideas for this one-shot. They could pick an idea from the list, or if they have a different idea, they could tell me. I just needed a headcount and an idea of what everyone would be playing. Nobody got back to me about it. Two days before my one shot was supposed to happen, Dungeon Master asked if we were doing his game or my game. I couldn't finish prepping until I knew everyone's characters, and since this group refuses to get invested, I thought having the participating character creation would help, but it didn't. I caved and just told the DM to do another session of his game. We didn't actually play his game again until two months later. Dungeon Master was finally in person, but the fourth player couldn't show up again. It was alright, but my spirit for the campaign was soured by how I seemed to be the odd one out consistently. I was the only one with any character out with a voice with a backstory, but I tried to get my character personality got insulted for it, so I just went through the motions of the game? It has been about two months since the last game. A few weeks ago, the Dungeon Master asked if we would be down for a game with a two-day notice. I said yes, and I said no, and I've heard nothing since. Of our group, two of us are graduating, and the rest are still in the program, so the separation may be from that. Sorry if this was long. It wasn't welcome to cut down any parts. The game just left me feeling embarrassed. I felt like a weirdo who gets too invested in D&D. Maybe it's just not a good fit for the group. Maybe they're just a genuinely bad group. I honestly can't tell, if anything. I hope the new players can find it enjoyable and that she's able to play more in the future. Look, I've said in the past that D&D and Super Casual don't mix, and I got a lot of flack for that. And yeah, I get it. Look, there's games that are really casual, and that's awesome. However, I genuinely think that if you're gonna take it this casually, you could do literally anything else. Like D&D is not the only hobby out there you could play with your friends. When we're not feeling the D&D vibe, my group and I play Minecraft, we play Helldives, we play something more casual, something easier to get into. Yeah, sure, super casual D&D with zero character development, zero role playing, zero world building, zero chemistry between players, and zero combat tactics. Yeah, I mean, sure, if you take out everything that makes D&D fun, I guess in theory you can still have fun with something else, but I mean, I feel like you're missing out, you know? And again, like I said, why don't you play literally anything else? Look, at the end, this group have their style, and you know what, that's okay. I think this person just went into a group that was way more casual than what she was expecting, and in the end, she should just find something that suits her taste. Don't try to mold this group into what you want, it's not gonna work. Hit the road and find something that's better fit for you. I, 22 female, have a friend, 27 female, we'll call Jane. Jane's cool, but she struggles socially and doesn't have many friends, which does seem to bother her a little. I meet up with my D&D group regularly. Jane has also played in the past with another group, so D&D does come up from time to time. Jane has expressed interest in getting back into Dungeons & Dragons, and I typically avoid talking about my party's adventures, specifically as to not brag about having a group. Either way, D&D is not the main thing Jane and I have in common, so neither of us really bring it up frequently. Recently though, Jane's been saying things like, Man, I really wish I could buy a D&D group, and I'll have to see about getting Fridays off so I can join you guys. I told Jane that I'd talk with everybody about inviting her in the potential case that someone has to quit, but frankly, I don't currently intend on doing that. There are a few reasons why I'm apprehensive about inviting her. Even though I like Jane, I like my D&D group, very worried about how everyone's gonna get along. I don't think they're gonna gel. I like doing specific things with specific friends. I can't explain it. I don't act like a wildly different person around each friend, but I like having a separate work life, school life, family life, and friend life. Dude, same. Seriously, sometimes I feel like I'm living a completely different life from day to day, depending on just who I'm with. I appreciate everyone's time and moderation. Jane is a coworker who I get along with at work and just recently started hanging out with. Also, our D&D group is beyond large. We still have fun, but this is partially because we're all very close and are quick to get inside jokes. I doubt we'll ever get down to four people, which tends to be the sweet spot for a campaign. We definitely can't reduce our size by inviting more people. Jane is a funny kid whose friendship I cherish on an individual level. I think her self-invitation comes from a place of not knowing how to ask me if I can let her join, but I don't want to have to invite her. 
I would love for her to go out there and make as many friends as makes her happy, but I'm hesitant to introduce her to my other friends. Would I be the a-hole if I don't invite my friend to join my D&D group? Mm, this is an important thing to talk about, so drum roll please. Yes, the a-hole! I'm messing with you, I'm kidding. You're not the a-hole! I don't know Jane and I don't know you, but I'm assuming that there are reasons why you don't think Jane and your friends are going to mesh. And frankly, you know those reasons. You're the resident expert on yourself and your relationships. And yeah, maybe Jane would work out. But your reasons are good ones as is, just without the compatibility thing. I mean, groups that get too big are groups that are hard to manage. And like you said, you don't make groups smaller by inviting more people. And also, compatibility is really important. It's not your responsibility to force these sort of connections to form. It's not your responsibility to force Jane to be compatible with everyone else. Like you said, Jane needs to find her own way in life. She can't just rely on you to invite her into games and fix her problems with socializing with others. That's not how it works. I think it is totally reasonable for you to not lean into this weird self-invitation. For context, I am a guy who has never had anything horrible like SA happen to me. I have a name that makes most people assume I'm a girl, even though there are plenty of guys with my name. Alright, alright, guesses. I'm gonna throw out Carrie. Met plenty of guy and girl Carries, but anyway. I was playing a Vengeance Paladin of the Raven Queen who had been attacked by a necromancer that killed her and her husband and son. She was revived by the Raven Queen with the promise that she would take down the necromancer and enter the afterlife with her family. She trained for about a year after the attack, long enough to learn her powers and to fight, but not long enough for the trauma and rage to fade. The only other person as important is the dungeon master in the story. I immediately suspected that he might not know I was a guy, as we didn't chat before the game, and we played on Roll20 slash Discord. I built the character using Polearm Master and Great Weapon fighting style. Great weapon, you know, for that re-roll and then you ones or twos on damage. This, with the Polearm Master feat and Paladin abilities, meant that I would be doing a lot of damage. Uh lot. When setting up for the game, he allowed me to have a special scythe that instead of dealing 1d10 damage, had a reflavored weapon that would instead do 2d6? I asked if he was sure, given that that would mean I would always average more damage for a lot of reasons, and he said yes. I figured he would give each player a strong weapon or ability. The day of the game comes, we get started. If the dungeon master was surprised I was a guy, he didn't say anything. I figured it wasn't a big deal. We started in a tavern, and we're gonna do some odd jobs off a quest board. We picked a few and roleplay drinking and learning about each other. I said that my character would get drunk because of, you know, <laughs> everything that happened to her. That was a mistake. I decided to joke to say that the female bartender should stop hitting on my character because she wasn't interested. That was also a mistake. What began was a series of saving throws with disadvantage that caused my character to keep drinking and not have any self-control. You know, I hear a lot of complaining about how terrible railroading is. The DM decided to have the bartender flirt with my character, who still denied her advances. When the night began to wind down, my character paid for a bath and went into it. The GM said that the bartender came in, slipped off her clothes, and sat in the tub with me. She poured me a drink, and I was powerless to do anything because of all my failed saves. My character woke up in her room the next morning with different clothes on. He then went on to the next scene, as if nothing happened. All right, as you guys are heading towards the fish market to pick up your tuna salad, uh, hey, you, you, you good, dude? Yeah, man, I honestly have no idea what's up with them. Yeah, I, I don't understand what the problem is with them. They just, they're just sitting there. I mean, really, th there's no reason why someone would be acting like yesterday. calmly waited until my turn came around again. I rounded up the cleric and asked him to prep a zone of truth. My plan was to interrogate the bartender and probably execute her. I asked for the bartender and was told she wasn't there and no matter what I did, I could not find her in town. I again waited patiently for the end of the session because I figured this was at least a plot point. Clearly this bartender was a succubus or using some poison to extract kidneys or something other than simple, you know, but no. I exited the call and sent a message to the group saying, I would not keep playing in a group with 
that kind of content as a day one event and I just exited the campaign. The dungeon master sent me a message saying that I would not be welcome back to the campaign because I was too immature for the group. You're, you're not quitting. I'm firing you. After a lot of back and forth, he said that the plan was for us to come back in a few months and find out that I had simply passed out in the bath and nothing had happened. But you, you, you left him behind for a few months? A few months of in-game and out-game time to find out my character wasn't assaulted. Nice. After that, I blocked him and just had to process what happened. He knew my backstory and my holy symbol was my wedding ring. I don't know what that DM was thinking. Honestly, I don't want to find out what this DM was thinking. Honestly, I think he just wanted a hot lesbian romance scene, but didn't remember that Emily and Sue and Dickinson have this thing called consent. I don't really have anything more to say about how gross this is. I will note that the OP does randomly include the dungeon master giving them an overpowered weapon for no reason, which by the way, don't do that. Players are more than capable of optimizing their own characters. Maybe this is just a me thing, but Wait, as a guy on, who does like difficult saves. combats, I do want my players to be powerful, but I want them to be powerful on their own terms. It's so much fun creating a character that's powerful yourself rather than the DM like giving you a bunch of helping hands. I mean, obviously the DM should probably give you items and such to increase your power, but stuff like this, like leave that up to the players. Though, let's be honest, that's just a freaking side note compared to what the DM's actual crimes are. Hey, so I'm actually filming this as I'm getting ready to leave and return home from Italy, which is very exciting. I've had a wonderful vacation. I would have filmed this outro somewhere cool, like the Coliseum, but you know, I kind of like living in the moment because I'm quirky like that. So sorry, don't have any cool footage, but I am here now. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Shadow Over Kerkonos D&D podcast. The full adventure is linked up in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down in the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment an older problem player to let me know to the end of the video. Hey, by the way, if you have your own horror stories, you can send them directly to us. There's an email in the description. Send your stories our way for a chance to be featured in one of these videos. But hey, even if you don't have any stories, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Farewell. Comment. Hmm.